Welcome to Grey Sheep and Hedge Wizards, my Song of Ice and Fire show, where I talk about a Song of Ice and Fire, with me, Apples and Dragons, your friendly neighborhood a Song of Ice and Fire nerd. Today's topic is going to be Dorn's Letter, Part 3. The spoiler warning is everything published in the series, up to the date at the beginning of this video, and of course, Parts 1 and 2. So before you watch this, you'll want to read and watch all of that. I won't bother with a summary because this is part three, and I should assume that you've watched part two and you're ready to jump into the new stuff. We left off with the discovery that dragon glass is dragon's weakness. It can pierce dragon scales and kill dragons because it's sharper than steel, while dragon scales are harder than steel. It remains to be seen in the story which one is more harder or sharper than steel than the other, but it's plausible either way in that the contents of Dorne's peace proposal letter to Aegon the Conqueror basically told them that when he burned the Hellholt, he created Dragonglass, and that they tested the Dragonglass on Meraxi's body, and discovered that it can pierce dragon scales and kill dragons. And that if Aegon brings war to Dorne again, they will use the Dragonglass to kill the remaining two Targaryen dragons. And so that explains Aegon's flight to Dragonstone where he didn't know that Dragonglass can kill dragons, and he didn't know that he accidentally gave them Dragonglass when he burned the Hellholt and the surrounding sands. So to test it, he flew to Dragonstone on the back of Balerion, under cover of night, went into the tunnels under Dragonstone, and retrieved some of the Dragonglass that we know is there, where Stannis Baratheon says that his men found Dragonglass in the tunnels under Dragonstone. In part one, I said that one of the curious things about this mystery is the timing of the letter. That the letter was sent soon after Myria the Yellow Toad died, her son and heir Prince Nymor ascended, and he gave the letter to his daughter and heir Deria to deliver it to Aegon in King's Landing. It's almost as if Myria the Yellow Toad's death somehow enabled the persuasion in the letter. Now that I've read and thought about this situation more, I finally understand why. And that's the biggest new thing I wanted to share. So let's grab the World of Ice and Fire and turn to the Dorne section, page 247. The two years that followed were later called the Years of the Dragon's Wrath, grief stricken at the death of their beloved sister. King Aegon and Queen Visenya set ablaze every castle, keep, and hold fast in Dorne at least once save for Sunspear and the Shadow City. Why this is so remains a matter of conjecture. In Dorne, it was said the Targaryens feared that Princess Myria had some cunning means of slaying dragons, something she had purchased from Lys. That excerpt shows me that apparently the people of Dorne had some awareness that Myria had discovered some secret way of killing dragons. They just didn't know the details that it was dragon glass. They thought it was something she had purchased from Lice. It continues, Likelier, however, is Archmaester Timothy's suggestion in his Conjectures that the Targaryens hoped to turn the rest of the Dornish, who suffered so much destruction, against the Martells, who were spared. If this is true, it may explain the letters dispatched from the marches to the Dornish houses, urging them to surrender and claiming that the Martells had betrayed them by buying their safety from the Targaryens at the expense of the rest of Dorne. So the Targaryens burned every castle holdfast in keep in retaliation for the killing of Rhaenys and Meraxes. And they did this for two years, called the Dragon's Wrath. The only castle they didn't burn was Sunspear, and there's a question about why. One possibility given is that Princess Myria had some cunning means of slaying dragons that she purchased from Lice. And Archmaester Timothy's idea is that the Targaryens were trying to turn the Dornish people against the, the Martells, their principal house, their leaders. That's something else I learned. Um, a prince in princessdom is called a principality, which is nice because it has prince in the word. So the question remains, why didn't House Martell send the letter sooner? I mean, they've had the Dragonglass and Meraxi's corpse for two years. 
They must have tested it by now. Maybe they didn't think to try it for two years. But it seems kind of unlikely, because it contrasts with the desperation of their situation. Surely they would try every material available to them, on Maraxi's corpse to find what can defeat these dragons, while the remaining two dragons are going from castle to castle, burning them all down. It seems to me that what happened was that Miriam Martel, having discovered the secret that Dragonglass can kill dragons, wanted to use it. Miria was holding out for an opportunity to kill Aegon's dragons. She wanted Aegon and Visenya to come back, so that Dorne can use their new dragonglass-tipped scorpion bolts to slay the last two dragons. And so when Miria died in year 13, and Nymor ascended, Nymor apparently disagreed with his mother's approach, realized that he didn't need to actually use the dragonglass in order to, to stop the war. He could just leverage it in a letter. It sacrifices his elements of surprise, because the Targaryens didn't know yet that the Martells had dragonglass, and that dragonglass can kill dragons. And her successor, Prince Nymor, took the more level-headed, and maybe some would say more cowardly option, of leveraging the dragonglass in a letter. It shows me that Nymor was more interested in just ending the war, and getting Dorne back to normal, than in avenging Dorne against the dragon lords, the glory of slaying three dragons, or of liberating the rest of the continent from the tyranny of the Dragon Lords. In true Dornish fashion, they love freedom to the bone, but they're only really concerned with their own. So imagine being a Dornish knight or commoner, and you're at the tail end of the first Dornish war, and Aegon and Visenya are burning down basically every building in your country. They're on a rampage, and after having already killed your friends, family, and loved ones, between their military and dragon fire. If you knew that your leaders had discovered a stone that can kill dragons, what would you really want Prince Nymor to do? To send Aegon terms of peace in hopes that he'll accept them, or to have Aegon and Visenya return with their dragons, unknowingly flying to their certain demise at the business end of a scorpion bolt. A scorpion bolt tipped with dragon glass that Aegon accidentally gave you when he burned one of your castles. <laughs> That victory was far too sweet to pass up. And so that's why the Martells probably kept the secret of the Dragonglass. A Martell secret. And there's a line at the end of the Dorn's Letter mystery, in Fire and Blood, that alludes to this, um, this vengeful desire to uh, use the Dragonglass and get the revenge on the dragons and the dragon lords. I'll read that. The Dornish victory, if victory it was, was seen to be dishonorable, and the survivors of the fight, and the sons and brothers of those who had fallen, promised one another that another day would come, and with it a reckoning. Their vengeance would need to wait for a future generation, and the accession of a younger, more bloodthirsty king. I think that's referring to Daron the Young Dragon. The role and character of Dorne as a whole, in the story as a whole, has this consistent vengeful thread to it, where there's some secret revenge that Dorne has access to, and they've been waiting to use it for a very long time. And that's the Dragonglass. That's the knowledge that Dragonglass can kill dragons. It also explains why Dirio waited to give the letter to Aegon until Aegon settled on continuing the war. Almost settled on continuing the war. Nymor still didn't want to give up the info about Dragonglass, except as a last resort, hoping that the non-Dragonglass persuasions would work so that his family can keep the Dragonglass secret under wraps, in case they need to use it in a future war. It preserves the elements of surprise. And ever since the first Dornish War, about 300 years ago, Dorn has never had to use the Dragonglass to kill dragons. And so the Martells are still sitting on that secret. And allusions to the secret being used are made in the prologue of A Feast for Crows. From the point of view of Pate at the Quillen Tankard. So let me grab that real quick. The 
This chapter is about a group of students at the Citadel in Old Town who are hanging out in the late evening at a, uh, an inn called the Quillen Tankard. Some of the characters present are Pate, Armin, Alaris, Lazy Leo, and Mollander. Alaris, as you'll probably know by now, is um, Sorella Sand, because Alaris backwards is Sorella. And Sorella Sand is the bastard daughter of Oberyn, one of many. Or in other words, she's a sand snake. But she's incognito, and she's pretending to be a boy. Because girls aren't allowed to study at the Citadel. But in her first year, she's already forged three links of her maester's chain, one of them being copper, and copper represents history, study of history. Which is interesting, because the way that we learned that Dorn and the Martells have dragon glass, and that dragon glass can kill dragons, is that we studied history. Because if you'll remember, the world of ice and fire and fire and blood are in story history books. That means that it's conceivable that Alaris has read them. And if Alaris has read them, she may have discovered the same things we did. Page 5. Alaris would make a maester. He had only been at the Citadel for a year, yet already he had forged three links of his maester's chain. Page 7. Leo turned to Alaris. A lord's son should be open-handed, Sphinx. I understand you won your copper link. I'll drink to that. Alaris smiled back at him. I only buy for friends, and I am no lord's son. I've told you that. My mother was a traitor. <laughs> that line is uh, technically true. She's no lord's son. She's a lord's daughter. Her mother was a traitor. She's the captain of a ship from the Summer Islands. Page 10. You saw some candle burning, I don't doubt, said Armin. A candle of black wax, perhaps. I know what I saw. The light was queer and bright, much brighter than any beeswax or tallow candle. It cast strange shadows, and the flame never flickered, not even when a draft blew through the open door behind me. Armin crossed his arms. Obsidian does not burn. Dragon glass, Pate said. The small folk call it dragon glass. Somehow that seemed important. They do, mused Alaris, the Sphinx. And if there are dragons in the world again. Dragons and darker things, said Leo. After Alaris says, and if there are dragons in the world again, there's an ellipsis which suggests that she was about to say something more, or uh, stopped herself from saying more. So if Alaris has her copper link, having studied history, and studied the histories of the First Dornish War, and learned like we did, that Dragonglass can kill dragons, and that the Martells have Dragonglass, and that they're sitting on this secret, maybe what she was about to say was that, and if there are dragons in the world again, we're going to need that Dragonglass. To kill them. <laughs> That's so cool. So that seems to be part of Dorne's role in the story. Is that they've got the secret weapon that can bring down the tyrant family and their monsters. And they've been sitting on it for nearly 300 years. <laughs> and so it's this massive Chekhov's gun that predates the beginning of this story by like 290-something years, 280-something. And if a person as young as Sorella Sand can figure out the dragon glass kills dragons by studying history, then so can the wizened and aged historian Maester Gildane, who wrote Fire and Blood, and Maester Yandel, who wrote The World of Ice and Fire. And so maybe the reason that enough information is available in these histories to allow us to figure that out is because the maesters left the information in there on purpose. They snuck it in there. In subtle ways, the sleuthing readers can figure it out, but it won't be so obvious that it's likely to get the historian punished or censored or killed for disseminating very sensitive information that threatens the, the ruling family and their power.
and this is reflected in Maester Gildane's title, Archmaester. Archmaesters, unlike Grand Maesters, do not work directly for the king out of the king's landing, out of the capital. They work at the citadel for the citadel, pursuing true knowledge, because true knowledge is their passion. And so I can imagine that when one of these maesters gets the letter from the king that says, you've been, you've been specially selected to serve your king <laughs> as one of the royal propagandists, I mean, uh, Grand Maester, the reaction of a maester who's genuinely interested in the pursuit of knowledge is probably tearing his hair out, like, oh no, I wanted to devote my life to knowledge, not propaganda. But since the request comes from the king, you can't really refuse the king without uh, raising suspicion about your loyalty to the king or offending him. Um, kings being the sorts of people who are not used to hearing the word no. Which is a point that Catelyn makes to Ned when King Robert comes to enlist Ned's help to be his hand of the king. And so A Song of Ice and Fire's meta commentary that its audience is, tends to be enamored with tyrants is echoed in our disregard for the maester's lived perspective. We can't really relate to what it's like to live under a, a dictator or a monarchy or an authoritarian because in the modern Western world, we are so free to say the truth. And truth is generally an ultimate defense. In the context of history, it's a very special, unique, and new sort of society that we live in. So A Song of Ice and Fire's author, George R. Martin, was able to rely upon our naivety about what it's like to live under an absolute monarchy and have to go to great pains to, to encode the truth in your history book, like Maester Yandel and Gildane are doing. Archmaester, because as I can see from the additions of the Grand Maesters, they're very much writing the propaganda that they have to write in order to protect themselves. And so I have some sympathy for Grand Maester Pycelle, our present day Grand Maester, who lives in the Red Keep with the kings that he's required to write propaganda for, tiptoeing around their interests and sensitivities and sensitive information like Joffrey is a bastard of incest between Cersei and Jaime, <laughs> and therefore an illegitimate king, that'd be a dangerous thing to write under the reign of Joffrey, or even Tommen, whose claim is rooted in the same claim that Joffrey's is, Robert. So yes, Grand Maester Pycelle is a, a Lannister kiss-ass, but he has to be, because they made him a Grand Maester. And you and I would do the same thing if they made us a Grand Maester, because we wouldn't have any choice. Not when the alternative is uh, professional suicide slash suicide by a king. So as I was rereading some of this mystery, the Dorn's Letter mystery, I came upon some lines that are hilariously overdetermined. They have an alternative interpretation that was not accessible until we learned about the dragon glass. So now I'll read some of those because they're really cool and they make me laugh. In Fire and Blood, page 37, it says, Her son Nymor succeeded her as Lord of Sunspear and Prince of Dorne. Sixty years old, his health already failing. The new Dornish prince had no appetite for further slaughter. No appetite for further slaughter. It seems to be referring to the further slaughter of his own people. It's referring to the further slaughter of dragons. <laughs> He could have killed the rest of the dragons, but he decided not to. An immediate peace was preferable to a uh, belated peace. Here's the best one. This is in the World of Ice and Fire, page 249, in the Dorn section. It says, The result, however, was a peace that lasted through the troubles of the Vulture King and beyond. Prince Corin Martell did lead the Dornish to fight in support of the Triarchy, when they warred with Prince Daemon Targaryen and the Sea Snake over the Stepstones. During the Dance of the Dragons, both sides courted the Dornish men, but Prince Corin refused to take part. Dorn has danced with dragons before, he was reported to have said in response to Sir Otto Hightower's letter. I would sooner sleep with scorpions. On a first reading, it seems to mean 
I don't want to fuck with dragons no more. I did that already. It sucked. On a second reading, <laughs> it means I'm going to lay low with my scorpion siege weapons that are armed with dragon glass. That's freaking brilliant. <laughs> it tells the truth in a way that's completely undetectable to anybody who doesn't know that uh, dragon glass kills dragons and that Doran has dragon glass. And it also does it in a way that appeases the Targaryen ego. Throughout the story, dragon glass is also referred to as obsidian. And so it's an instance of maesters renaming things or giving old things a new name a new technical, sort of scientific sounding kind of name. But in doing so, they accidentally erase important information that was encoded in the original name. In this case, Dragon Glass encodes the knowledge that this black glass can be used to kill dragons. So when they change the name to Obsidian, people forgot this can be used to kill dragons. Another thing that seems probably recontextualized by the Dragon Glass discovery is Doran Martell's patience in the main series, where Doran Martell is characterized as this very patient leader of Dorn, and he's so patient that um, it's a problem. Some of his family, like the Sand Snakes, are uh, losing patience with him. They want revenge for wrongs and offenses that were done to House Martell and Dorn, but Doran is not getting involved. He's staying out of the, the wars and biding his time for some secret reason that he apparently can't just tell Arianne. And so maybe the secret that Dragonglass can kill dragons is somehow that reason. Doran could be positioning House Martell for uh, a situation or an opportunity when that secret will become useful. Anyway, guys, I think that's going to wrap up part three. I had fun. I hope you did too. This will probably be the last installment of the Doran's Letter Mystery. Because I have a feeling that the things I learned in this Doran's Letter Mystery are going to help us solve other mysteries in the story. Now that we know that Dragon Glass can kill dragons, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.